All righty. So why don't we move on to uh, to imaging of the hips, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about protocols, not much, uh, and then a little bit about congenital, not much. A lot more about osteonecrosis, and we'll go on to trauma and infection. Uh, so I think you're all seeing the protocol we use. I won't I won't go through this, but uh, we've tried a number of different ones over the years, and this is the one that uh, uh, our Orthopedic radiologists have decided that they 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 like the oblique axial uh, T1 weighted images, as we can see here, oblique using the uh, uh, the coronal images, and uh, we use these to evaluate for the uh, alpha angle that that you you already know about, but we'll talk about it further. Uh, though there are some other planes that other people feel are more reliable for the alpha angle, but we'll talk about that uh, that later. This is what the oblique axial images look like. This is a T1 weighted image. Uh, we typically do PD fat set if the scanners give us good quality. Uh, otherwise, we do T1. So some of the lower field scanners are better with T1. Uh, here's a PD fat set, but notice that this is not very good quality. Notice that there's a lot of artifact obscuring fine detail. Uh, the reason for that, however, is if you notice, there's a lot of flow artifact going horizontally here. Uh, in this, if we change the face encoded direction, we get much better quality images. So the one thing you need to realize if you go out and when you go out into practice is that uh, if you see a uh, flow artifact like that, you need to change the uh, direction of the face encoding so that you can get rid of it and it doesn't project the artifact over over the anatomic area you're interested in. Uh, there are some people who are big believers in arthrography of the hips and, and others less so. Uh, I think with <laughs> current state-of-the-art imaging, most of the information we need to get from the hip, we can get without arthrography. Uh, though uh, there are a few people, uh, like the people back at Thomas Jefferson, who originally weren't big arthrography people, but they then studies showing that arthrography is more reliable at looking at both uh, labral tears as well as articular cartilage disease than imaging with without arthrography, but but I still like to use non-arthrography as as our standard for imaging the hips, and I think that the vast majority of the time we can get the appropriate information without having to put contrast in the joint space. Uh, and again, uh, we have a slightly different protocol, but we just uh, do a little bit more T1-weighted fat-suppressed images uh, when we do arthrography. And I don't think we really need to go through the anatomy. I think everyone here is pretty familiar with the anatomy. Uh, there can be a problem when there are metal in the hips. And as you know, hip prostheses are, are very common. Uh, we try to use techniques which decrease the uh, effect of the metal but uh, they're far from perfect. And if you don't have any of the new fancier techniques, then stir imaging and uh, uh, T2 weighted imaging without fat suppression uh, uh, usually can give a reasonably good uh, visualization of the bone surrounding the, the prosthesis and look for any loosening or fluid collections within the bone and, and around it. So, uh, well, with neoplasia, again, if it's a soft tissue neoplasia, then typically, at least at the, the first uh, time we image it, I, I like to give contrast. So we need to do images with and without contrast. Uh, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of these images? That This patient had a neoplasm that involved part of the ilium on the left and had a resection. The patient came back a uh, about a year later, and they just want to rule out recurrence. The patient is asymptomatic at this time. Uh, and here are the images. What do you think? Um, okay, so we can see partial resection of that left iliac bone, and there's some intermediate T1 signal intensity material there that does demonstrate enhancement on post-contrast images. Um, I would think this is suspicious for recurrence, although it could okay. also be scar tissue, but I wouldn't expect scar tissue to enhance. Okay, so like if we blow it up, that's what it looks like in the post-contrast images. 
Here's what it looked like on the T1 weighted fat sat pre-contrast images. There we go. I was going to ask that because we need to compare fat sat. So on the T1 fat sat pre-contrast, if you compare that to the T1 fat sat post-contrast, there's really no evidence of enhancement. It's intrinsically bright. And so that's the value. You always have to have the same type of images pre and post contrast. Yeah, and, and we've talked about this before, but I just want to keep emphasizing that because it's very easy to go back here and say that you have contrast enhancement and uh, you need to biopsy it or, or further. But it's you really, it, it's really, you can't say that unless you're dealing with the same pre and post contrast image. Good. So this, this actually was just post-operative scarring and there was no tumor. Okay, look at a few congenital lesions. Ashley, what do you think of this? Um, looks like there is a deformity. So 38 year old with chronic deformity. So it's chronic and we're in the congenital lesions. I almost think that the femur is very focally like proximally, like it's deficient. Uh, I think this is the proximal focal femur deficiency or something yeah. um, and yeah. that, that fibula you can see it that means that the tibia is right there so it's a probably very short limb yeah okay all right uh, uh, Jennifer this patient had long-standing hip pain okay uh, so long-standing hip pain I would wonder if they have more pain on the right side it looks like there's probably a decreased center edge angle and under coverage of that right hip um, that there is some dysplasia of the acetabulum, which is greater on the right than the left. Yeah. Um, so probably, you see a large labra, probably a labral tear here on the left. And uh, well, we'll go through some of the angles in a minute. The tonus angle would be abnormal on both sides here. And I'll go through how you measure the tonus angle in, in just a minute. Uh, okay, good. So, so this is this is congenital dysplasia, and this patient has unstable hips bilaterally. Uh, you also notice that there's a rotational deformity. If you look at the lesser trochanter on the right versus left, on the left, unless it's a whoops. Right. Something happened to my uh, computer. I don't know what. Uh oh, can you not see the images? But anyway, um, no, I can't. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll get back at it. Uh, anyway, um, you can tell rotation by looking at um, uh, lesser trochanter. Uh, on X-ray, uh, you can uh, the, the greater uh, the prominence of the lesser trochanter, uh, the more uh, normal it is, and and is not internally rotated. Good. Uh, well, that's something that you can probably, uh, well, hopefully you'll remember. It's a uh, one way yeah. to tell whether hip is dislocated or not. Uh, when it's yeah. dislocated, usually posterior 90% of the time, uh, you don't see the lesser choke. And you can um, bet that that hip is posteriorly dislocated. Thank you. Now I'm, trying, now I'm going to try to get a picture again. Oh, good. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Oh, good. Good. Uh, let's see. Hey, Ashley, are you next? I think so. Go ahead. Yeah, Wait. so 36 year old female with bilateral hip pain. I, I think the you can see bilaterally the center lateral edge angle looks deficient on both sides. Uh, I, yeah. I'd be worried about congenital hip dysplasia. Yeah. So yeah. they measure 18 and 16, which we'll see in a minute, is, is very abnormal. Right. Uh, so congenital hip dysplasia, there are a wide range of different things that would go under the uh, rubric of congenital hip dystrasia. The important thing about it is that there are a fair number of cases that go undetected until until adulthood. So don't be too surprised if an adult shows up with uh, hip pain and, and you find that they have congenital dysplasia. So you have to uh, evaluate it in everyone. And here we can just see uh, 
uh, the difference between uh, an abnormal center edge angle here, uh, and, and when that happens, what you do is that the, the force through the hip is concentrated in a much smaller area, therefore you have much greater pressure, uh, and that this can lead to early degenerative disease uh, of the hip. So there are a number of uh, measurements that, that people can do. I don't, we'll go through some of these in a minute as well, showing examples. There's a center edge angle, uh, there's a vertical center anterior margin angle and on oblique images, permal head neck shaft angle, uh, tonus angle, and the delta angle. And the ones that uh, really commonly use are uh, the center edge angle, the femoral head neck shaft angle, and the tonus angle. Uh, so here, the center edge angle, as you are all aware, you do uh, you do a circle through the mid portion of the femoral head, draw a line vertically up from the uh, center of the vertical head and then another line over to the edge of the acetabulum, and that's the center edge angle, and it should be greater than 25 degrees and, and normal. So here's abnormal uh, abnormal center edge angle because it's only 18 degrees. And usually I uh, eyeball this in, in the cases, and then if I'm concerned, I, I do the measurement. Vertical anterior center margin angle, you do oblique x-rays, uh, and you're uh, uh, used to, you need to look at an angle here, which should be greater than 25 degrees. Uh, this is not one that, that I co commonly uh, see or do, and it's it's one that's not straightforward on an MR examination. Uh, and here is the femoral head neck shaft angle, which you're also all familiar with. You just uh, a line down through the center of the neck, line down through the center of the shaft, and then you have the, this particular angle, Normal should be between 120 and 135. If it's greater than 135, it's coxa valga, and if it's less, it's coxa vera. So coxa valga, coxa vera. And then kind of think about that. If you put the head in the correct position, then the leg will go out laterally if it's coxa valga. Now the tonus angle is one that a lot of the orthopedic surgeons talk about. <clears throat> Uh, in conferences, and this is one where if you look at the uh, acetabulum and you draw a line from the the top of the of, of the, the medial margin of the sorsal, here's the sorsal, over to the lateral margin, and then a line from the medial margin horizontally, uh, this is the tonus angle. And it tends to be elevated in people with abnormal center edge angles. And uh, it's commonly seen in dysplasias, as we can see here on the right side of the images, and is associated with uh, uh, instability of the hip. Normal should be uh, less than 13 degrees. And then the other thing you can measure is the fovea to see whether the fovea is a, a proper position or not, or whether it's elevated. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's a fovea angle where you go from the center of the head and the coronal plane, uh, for, uh, up to the sorsal, and then another line over to the top edge of the fovea, and that angle uh, should be uh, less than 10 degrees. I'm sorry, less than 10 degrees is abnormal. Okay, and, and then there are other measurements that can be made with CT to look at abnormal orientation of the bones. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, you know, they have the different acetabular angles to see whether you have uh, inversion or eversion of the, of the acetabulum and then over coverage, which we'll talk about when we get to uh, femoral acetabular impingement. Okay. And then here's just a reference where you can see some of these. So, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Um. So this is a 33-year-old runner with hip pain. Um, it looks like there might be some edema at the iliopsoas attachment to the lesser trochanter. I can't tell if that in here. that's artifact or not. Yes. No. Yeah, no, and down there. Artifact. Now, one thing you look here, it really looks like the... Uh, the, the angle of the proximal femur is is abnormal here. One problem okay. that you have to worry about with MR is when you do when you make the I forgot the name of it now. What do they call it here? 
uh, the femoral head neck shaft angle is you can get a spurious abnormalities uh, if you if you're an inversion or e, or eversion. So uh, if you have a very inverted uh, uh, femur uh, on the on the on the coronal images, uh, you you can make the angle uh, larger than it would normally be. So you have to make sure that the, that you're really in a plane uh, that's in the plane of of the angle of the of the uh, of the proximal femur. Uh, so what we're seeing here that you're right. This is edema. Uh, this is a fairly common location for a calcaneal stress injury uh, in this runner. And this patient might have a little coxivalga as uh, increased risk for uh, a strain pattern that could lead to this. So uh, here it just shows the, the different patterns. And in this particular patient had an, uh, well, had a measurement, if you went back and measured, there was a uh, Cox of Alga range. Uh, but again, I, I like to look through all the images and convince myself that I'm actually measuring it on plane that's, uh, that it's in plane to the angle of the, of the femur. When I do that measurement, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? All right, so we have a three-year-old male born, 34 weeks premature. Um, there's a, quite a bit of deformity of the femoral heads bilaterally. Um, almost looks like there's, uh, I don't know if they're fractured or collapse of the epiphysis. Um, uh, it doesn't look like your typical AVN, but Almost it just looks like they okay dysplasia bilateral yeah, so, dysplasia. So they're a little bit large if you measure them, uh, and this is uh, one form of, of dysplasia. Right. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Okay, so this is an eight-year-old male. He's had lower back pain for one month. Uh, I'm not sure what OPD means. No pain on OPD. You know, I don't know what that means either. Um, so the bilateral hips, it looks like they're mostly cartilage. They seem like they're normally seated on the frog leg images. Um, I don't see any oh, evidence of just. Here it may be a little bit irregular, but I, I think that's okay. a, that's a little bit subtle on the plain films. The the knees mm -hmm. don't look that abnormal. If you go to the MR scan, uh, there's a there's a little bit of irregularity of the uh, of the growth plates. They really shouldn't be this irregular, which we're seeing here. And this is this okay. is a subtle form of epiphyseal dysplasia. Okay, thank you. When it's, you know, in this case, it's called Myers dysplasia, which is congenital. Okay. Uh, Ashu. Uh, all right. So this is a 20-year-old female with trauma. Um, looking for a fracture here. Um, oh, is there something? Uh, this left sacral ala. Is there some irregularity there? Yeah. And it looks like there's some, yeah, it looks like there's irregularity and there's tilting of that. Uh, I think there might be a fracture. Well, I think there's a big there. defect here, right? Oh, there's a defect, yeah. There's a posterior defect there. And then there's, so we can see a lot of uh, ab a very abnormal sacrum here. Uh, yeah, it's like it's here. absent. So this is uh, sacral agenesis or Ferrarinos uh, syndrome. But I just point out that uh, yeah, sometimes uh, it's easy to overlook the sacrum when you're looking at these kind of films. Just, uh, so uh, let's go on now and talk about osteonecrosis. It's something that we'll see much more, much more commonly. So uh, aseptic necrosis is uh, defined really as marrow cell death from either an anoxic or toxic uh, uh, injury to the bone marrow. And the uh, old days, osteonecrosis was basically a pathognomonic of infection. 
up until the early part of the last century when antibiotics came online. And with, with a- antibiotics, uh, more and more osteonecrosis was the aseptic type, mm. uh, which, which we'll be talking about. Now, when you uh, kill cells, there are basically three stages, uh, especially with anoxic injury. Uh, one is uh, if you uh, stop the, the blood supply, you'll get initially an interruption of the function of the enzymes because you lose power. You no longer have oxygen, uh, oxygenated uh, or ATP flowing in to be, uh, to, to be created and used in the cells, and so you don't have the energy, so the enzymes stop. Uh, you then get alteration of metabolism because of the lack of the enzymes, and eventually if that lasts long enough, you'll get destruction of the of the internal structure of the cells, and then uh, that's irreversible cell death at that point. Uh, the t- cell death varies depending upon the kind of environment that the cell is in. For hematopoietic cells, it's somewhere between six to eight hours. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts, uh, around a day or two, fat cells can last much longer before they irreversibly die. And then there are a lot of uh, associations uh, with uh, osteonec- with avascular necrosis, which we can see here, trauma, hemoglobinopathies, drugs, alcoholism, uh, disparate pregnancy, collagen vasculitis, pancreatitis, and so forth. Now, what we see with MR is the body's response to cell death. So first you get cell death, then what happens is that cell membranes break down and internal molecules within the cell uh, diffuse out of the cell. Uh, Those induce an inflammatory response by by the body and you get inflammation. And then eventually in areas at the interface between the cell death and uh, functioning cells, you'll get a reactive interface You'll then uh, get uh, destruction of a lot of the trabecular bone in the area where you no longer have uh, uh, cells. That, that'll that lead to remodeling of the bone and then eventually articular collapse. So what we look for for MR is when you when you first get death of the cells before you have a host uh, immune response, the MR scan is really normal, as are, is really all the imaging. <clears throat> Next, what happens is you start getting marrow edema on MR scan. And this is a stage also where occasionally the bone scan starts being hot. Uh, then you'll get a reactive interface, which we see as a, a ring sign uh, on uh, fluid sensitive type images. And this is the most specific finding that we see to really let us know that we're dealing with uh, AVN versus other causes of bone marrow edema. Later on, you'll get fat cell death. Initially, this will give you a very homogeneous appearance of fat within the marrow space on T1 and then eventually loss of the fat signal altogether. Then you'll get structural loss with subchondral fractures. This is the stage when it typically becomes very symptomatic. And then finally, articular collapse, degenerative change, and loss of function of the joint space. So pain mostly correlates with the uh, subchondral fractures, which as we'll see in a minute is called Steinberg stage three in the disease uh, due to really subchondral fractures. So there are a lot of different grading systems in the past. And again, this is something that you you know for historical reasons, I really don't use these uh, anymore. Uh, One is the Ficard Arlette classification, which is primarily an x-ray classification. uh, initially, you'd only evaluate patients with pain. So initially, uh, they'd be pain. They would have negative x-rays, but you could see uh, edema on an MR examination. That was stage zero. Stage one, pain, you start seeing osteoporosis, but intact subchondral bone on x-ray uh, and edema on MR. Stage two, you had pain. You start getting sclerosis or compression of the trabecula, which makes it denser on x-rays. Uh, <clears throat> with MR, we see edema and things are intact. Stage three, you start getting mechanical symptoms on plain films. You lost, you lose the shape, spherical shape of the head on X-rays, and you see subchondral fractures and loss of signal intensity within the bone, and then degenerative disease. Uh, Don Mitchell came up with a classification looking at with just with MR, looking at the signal intensity of uh, the marrow space over here, where we look for. Uh, uh, to changes in the fat, hemorrhage, edema, and fibrosis. I don't think that this is a useful classification 
uh, but you might hear someone of it. I'm giving a lecture right now. Uh, and then uh, there's a Steinberg classification, which is used in a lot of orthopedics. Uh, where And here, again, we'll see the changes that we'll talk about before, but most of the, the primary uh, symptoms when a lot of patients will present is a Steinberg stage three, where you get a crescent sign on plain films, which is a little subchondral fracture on MR, which we'll look at. Then later on, you'll get flattening, joint space narrowing, and advanced collapse. And then there's an ARCO classification from the bone circula circulation and necrosis system. And uh, I really won't go through this because we really don't use this either, but uh, you can refer to it if some of your physicians use it. And here's the typical anatomy, T1-weighted imaging on MR, STIR imaging, where we can see the, the typical fat suppression, sagittal images, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we see the anterior uh, labrum, which you're all familiar with, and then the typical anatomy. Now, the early stages of osteonecrosis typically present with loss of signal on the T1-weighted images. You lose the fat signal and increase signal intensity on the fluid-sensitive images, uh, as we can see here. Now, one thing that some people believe may be typical of uh, osteonecrosis is where you see uh, lack of edema within the fat right in the center of the lesion, and it's called the absent edema sign. Uh, I really don't believe this is reliable, so I don't like to use it. I think you can have a trabecular uh, uh, fracture pattern that can look like this, and this can still be normal bone up here. So I don't think it's specific for AVN, but so you might occasionally hear the absent edema sign. The double Einstein we typically see in state, uh, Steinberg stage two. Uh, and this is uh, really the uh, findings that are really characteristic of AVN to separate it from acute traumatic injury uh, or other causes of bone edema like osteitis from inflammatory disease. And that's where you see the double line sign, which is seen, it was originally described on standard T2-weighted images where you see a bright signal next to a low signal. The low signal is, was thought to be a sclerotic changes in fibrosis, the bright signal was thought to be the reactive interface, which is very vascular and has a lot of fluid in it, which makes it bright on fluid-sensitive images. It's also typically very irregular, like you see here. And this is an indication that we, you really have a reactive interface, which really makes it osteonecrosis. Steinberg 3, we see these linear low signal intensity within the subchondral bone, which are subchondral uh, fractures. Uh, where you just lost the integrity of the trabecular bone here, and the pressure is actually producing a little fracture. And this is really the, the finding that is most associated uh, with uh, pain. And then you go further, this is a little bit later. The double line sign is a little bit less uh, uh, sharply defined as you get more chronic disease. Here we can see a subchondral fracture and flattening of the head. So we now have more severe disease. We're actually getting remodeling and flattening of the femoral head due to the osteonecrosis. And this is, again, a subchondral fracture. And just uh, more progressive disease. Commonly, it's bilaterally. Usually, one, one hip is worse than the other. And again, reactive interface. I, th I think that 50% uh, are bilateral, John. So, okay, I didn't know it was that high, but that, that makes sense to me. And here again, we typically see two different stages. This is an indication of that bland fat signal that you see uh, when you start getting fat necrosis. The subchondral bone here on the left side is still intact. Here we can see the subchondral bone has been impacted on the right side, and we have a uh, you know, beginning collapse of the femoral head, and this would be a stage four. And with this, we typically see a lot of uh, subchondral bone marrow edema and stage four, four disease. And just other examples of uh, osteonecrosis bilaterally in these patients. Okay, uh, I don't know who was last. Do you guys know who was last? Uh, well, just, I think that I'm next. Okay, why don't you take this? This is a plain film of someone who has, I believe it was right hip pain. Okay. 
Um, I don't see any significant joint space narrowing or degenerative disease. Um, I don't this see is, any. This is a plain film, and here's the MR in that patient. Okay, so here we can see that double line sign and decreased T1 signal within the superior femoral head articular surface, probably yeah. compatible with avascular necrosis. Yeah, uh, so these could be subchondral cystic changes here, and we can actually see marginal osteophytes. And MR really is a lot more sensitive than plain films for marginal osteophytes, but this uh, was AVM. I don't think that's a double line sign, is it, John? I think these are more subchondral cysts rather than a double Einstein. And I think yeah. this is a late stage five disease where this is really the secondary degenerative disease. Yeah. Uh, that's a progression. Yeah. And here we can see another late disease where you're getting collapse of the, of the subchondral bone. And here we can see asymmetry where you have severe uh, collapse of the head on the left and we're seeing more early AVM on the right, and this would be a stage six on the left. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Okay, so five-year-old with hip pain, left hip looks like it's fairly abnormal. Um, the epiphysis is not well formed. There's uh, coxa vera deformity. Um, uh, this, this is concerning for uh, avascular necrosis of the Pythesis there, uh, leg calf purse disease. Right, so it's much smaller on the left than on the right. And, and here's the MR scan. What does that show? You can see again that there's, yeah, it's sclerosis. Uh, it's basically the epiphysis is, is not really there on the left side. Well, it's there, but it's and, very abnormal, uh, right. Yeah, very abnormal, and there's a lot of edema in there, and I think there's right. um, just looks very regular. Yeah. And there's some maybe some collapse as well. Yeah, maybe That's a little right. bit there. So in your, as you said, this is like half a Perthes disease, uh, uh, which is uh, thought to be uh, avascular necrosis of the uh, femoral head growth plate. And uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, a lot of people debate as as far as what the etiology is uh, of this. Certainly, trauma can can be associated with this, but a lot of these patients don't have necessarily defined trauma. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this one? Nine-year-old. Okay, so this is a nine-year-old with right hip pain. Uh, we can see a right hip effusion, and it looks like there may be some displacement of that right epiphysis, um, so I'd be concerned about Skiffy on the right. Well, um, you know, to, to me, it looks like it's hard to tell on what a image. very abnormal epiphysis, but I don't really actually see it displaced that much. But it's very abnormal, and uh, abnormal signal intensity within it here. And this is just an, another example of leg cafe perthes disease involving the right side in this particular patient. But I don't think it's that displaced. We'll 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 see some displaced ones later. And uh, uh, this was a young uh, young adult or, or a teen uh, a young adult who, as it says, was a asymptomatic until a couple of weeks ago. And then here is where you can see uh, the the left hip is very abnormal. Uh, this is a residual of leg cavity perthes disease where there's marked deformity of the left. Uh, hip joint space uh, due to the uh, osteonecrosis of the growth plate and the abnormal morphology. Okay, so a couple of questions to ask. Can it's, uh, it's kind of unusual to get it at 15. Uh, well, usually this is a in the nine year olds and 10 year olds, yeah. but not in 15 year olds. Yeah, the, lift gap, the lipophysis. No, this, this, patient had the, this, this patient had the disease at nine. The patient is now 20. Yeah, that was that's right. And the 15 uh, uh, kind of got me. Yeah, he's had no I'm symptoms sorry, since sorry. age 15 until two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that doesn't make sense to me. 
So, uh, so until he, fifteen, I, I, the history is abnormal. Well, so he had symptoms when he was uh, ages eight to fifteen, and then he pro just probably stopped using oh, it a lot. And wasn't symptomatic until age 21, and then it started hurting two weeks ago at age 21. Uh, okay, I, I just was a little confused with the history. Yeah, right. I can understand that. Okay, so that's just the residual of late calcium. Yeah, the, the way I remember um, hips is uh, at birth is con uh, is congenital. Um, the, dislocation um, and at uh, at nine you have um, AVN, uh, AVN at 15 uh, you have uh, uh, subluxation or slip capital epiphysis okay. and then uh, after that you get um, all kinds of other things adult disease right Okay, so a question here, uh, Ashu, can effusion synovitis measured on ultrasound or MRI predict response to intraarticular steroid inject injections in hip osteoarthritis? Um, I, I, I would, you know, I, I wouldn't think so, but um, well, what I they guess they do. Ultrasound and MRI measurements correlate very well with each other. Uh, uh, but they, uh, and the MR and ultrasound findings did not correlate with outcomes at eight weeks. And patient response to steroid injections, they felt, was probably not related to its anti-inflammatory effects. It probably has a more of a primary effect of, of, of pain control uh, rather than changing inflammation. Okay, uh, Jennifer. I don't I, I'm uh, not in favor of injecting hips with steroids. Okay. Uh, uh, for personal reasons. All right. So I think the value of steroid injections, as you just mentioned, is that it can relieve pain for some time, particularly if a patient doesn't want to undergo surgery and perhaps they have an event to attend or they're going out somewhere or they're very elderly, 80 or 90, I've seen some severe degenerative disease where they do not want surgery, but they do get some relief from having these injections. No, what, um, what I meant to tell you is, uh, is if you don't see degenerative disease, say you take an x-ray and everything looks normal, uh, injecting steroids into that hip is not a good idea unless you get an MRI. If you get an MRI and you see uh, osteonecrosis, I'm not so sure that's a very good idea to inject steroids. If it's an arthritic process, uh, it's okay, uh, a CC of um, whatever you want to inject is all, all right to, to help the hip, but uh, steroids are not very effective in, in the hip injections. Okay, thanks, John, and that's what this study shows. Uh, they both short and, and six-month follow-up. Uh, there, there is no difference between uh, patients and, uh, uh, and control groups and uh, symptoms. Uh, Ashu. Are patients more likely to have hip osteoarthritis progression and febrile head collapse after hip steroid anesthetic injections? You know, I would think that there might be a little bit of progression, but I don't think there's any significant. Yeah, it's been, that was controversial for a long time. Uh, now, <clears throat> Uh, the, this study showed that there was actually a, a, a statistical correlation with progression and femoral head collapse within 12 months after in those patients who were injected versus the control group. I remember when you and I had that discussion uh, years ago, maybe 10. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't think it was a good idea to inject. Right. Uh, 
and I think it, you, you said, well, no, I don't think it would would hurt anybody, but uh, it, it, it did damage me a little bit. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I didn't ask you first. <laughs> uh, and the guy injected five cc's of uh, very long uh, acting yeah. aristospan, uh, which right. uh, uh, I couldn't walk for about uh, 10 days. Oh my God, really? I was on uh, uh, and, and I'll never forget that. Uh, he says, oh, well, we might as well inject the, the whole bottle. <laughs> uh, and that, that, that didn't work out too well for me. Okay. Anyway, that's an old story. That's good. Jennifer. Uh, how well do x-ray and MRI grading of the severity of hip arthritis compare to the pathology? Um, so this, this was done where they looked at x-rays and then the patients had had uh, basically a, a total hip replacement and then they compared the pathology with the grading system on MRI and, and x-rays. I would think that the grading of x-ray and MRI is equivalent to pathology, except for very early cases of osteoarthritis, which we wouldn't do a replacement on. Yeah, so uh, because in early cases, you might see some early pathologic changes, but you may not see the findings yet on MRI. But in severe degenerative disease, I would think that severe would be equivalent. Well, what happens if you have pain in the hip instead of, I mean, in the back instead of the hip? How do you uh, how do you make a decision about a hip when you have back pain? Um, well, if there's lower back pain, a lot of times I'll also order imaging of the lumbar spine um, to rule out any cause of hip pain, especially if there aren't any findings on the radiographs or MRI. Well, then it may be helpful to look at the spine and vice versa. I, I had a patient that was seen by a, a chiropractor and manipulated. Of course, the hip gets stressed with that. Um, also had an MRI of the back and x-rays of the back that showed some degenerative disease. Um, not unusual for age, she's uh, 50 years old. <clears throat> and then he had an epidural injection when he came to California from Chicago. After that, he had another epidural injection. And all this time, uh, the diagnosis was uh, degenerative disease of the lumbar spine. And I saw the guy when he became my neighbor. And I said, uh, what's, the, what's wrong with your hip? He says, not my hip, it's my back. I said, I don't think so. I said, I think you have hip problems. I examined a guy and his left hip couldn't move. Wow. Uh, and he was examined by at least four, well, one chiropractor and th two or three other doctors, including that orthopod. Okay. And uh, he also had a congenital heart defect. He had a for Raymond O'Valley. Okay. Uh, now, uh, inject, and he was taking um, anticoagulants for that. Now, in, epidural injections are absolutely contraindicated in somebody who is on anticoagulants and somebody who has a hip problem rather than a Right. Uh, and, a, and a hip MRI, which I ordered, and John read, uh, I think you read it, or one of your colleagues, uh, it showed far advanced degenerative disease. Uh, yeah. uh, not, not the degenerative disease, AVN. Oh, I remember that case. That's right. Yep. You remember that one? I do. I uh, do. I got, the guy was so grateful to me after surgery here in Santa Monica. Yeah. He goes back to Palm Desert, and uh, I changed his bandages on a yeah. daily basis because he 
he, his skin was so thin and uh, that in, the incision was opening up. Oh my God. Uh, and I, I daily visits for almost a month. And you know what I got for all that? 50 cents. I, I got a martini and, <laughs> and he wouldn't even buy me a hot dog back then. Oh my God. So, so I had this, to save the guy's life. Wow, yeah. So, so this this study showed that the imaging findings are a reliable indicator of the severity of the osteoarthritis. So, uh, why don't we stop here and we'll go on to uh, 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 to uh, I think traumatic disease. We'll go on and talk about uh, trauma of the hip and uh, sports-related injuries tomorrow, okay? Any questions? Well, Sounds uh, good, thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. How is everybody? Have a good evening. Thank you, same with thank you, you John.